Hello, BookTube. It's Tuesday, and that means Tag Tuesday, when everyone on BookTube stops and does a tag of some kind. Uh, and I have a tag that uh, I wasn't tagged, of course, because I am an outcast, a leper, a pariah. Uh, but it's an older tag, too. It was made by Kappa Books, and it's the Omnivore Book Tag uh, from, I think, a couple of years ago. Uh, I wouldn't have known that it existed, except that the, the YouTube algorithm, the BookTube algorithm, served it up to me. And I like it. I like it a lot. It's all about uh, omnivore readers, so it won't apply to some of you. Some of you have very, made very, very, the very conscious choice not to be an omnivore, which is totally acceptable. I have known plenty of readers who were like that, where you decide, well, there's a million books out there, and I, I'm going to narrow the field. I really know what I like, and I don't want to be disappointed by going afield or starting from scratch. So I will read only epic fantasies, or I will read only murder mysteries, or, or a little more broadly than that, maybe some of you look at the whole of the reading world, backlist and new releases, and say, well, I won't say what that I'll only read X, Y, and Z, but I know what I won't read. I, I won't read A, B, and C under any circumstances, no matter what. Uh, and this tag probably won't be as useful to any of you who have made that kind of a decision because there isn't that much variation. But uh, I myself am an, am an omnivore reader, very much so. I won't go so far. This this tag was originally created by Kappa Books, I think is the name of the channel. And uh, in her video, she says that she would like to think there are no genres or subgenres that she categorically will not read. And I suppose that's true of me too. But there are plenty that I would, you know, tend to steer clear of if I could. Because <laughs> there are plenty of them that really don't have much to offer in the way of a good reading experience. But that still leaves a lot that I will read. I'm, I'm willing to, to, to stack the flexibility and adventurousness of my reading against that of pretty much anybody. Uh, and that is the, the, uh, the grounds for this tag. Once you, ha you are an omnivorous reader, then you start work on this tag, which is to pick four genres or subgenres that you read try to make them varied, and then go through those four genres or subgenres and answer, what is your favorite book in that genre or subgenre? What is your current book? And what is on your TBR? Uh, and I chose, uh, for my four categories, Westerns, because June on the Range is just a day away. I chose Star Trek, because Book Trek is just a day away. I chose Giant Killer Sharks, uh, because when are you not interested in giant killer sharks? Uh, and my last subcategory is a subcategory of history. I didn't so much choose it as it chose me. It's the Habsburgs and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, so those are our four. <laughs> and when, we, when it comes to favorites, uh, well, as I mentioned uh, last week for Tag Tuesday, my favorite Western is Lonesome Duck by Larry McMurtry. And then my favorite Star Trek book here, I want to draw the distinction between favorite and best. It's a distinction that I would like it if at least every critic drew that distinction and was, and was aware that it is real. <laughs> it's, it's fine for someone who never reads critically to think that whatever I like is also the best example of what I'm reading, but a critic should know better. And yet, I know a lot of critics who don't do that. They, they read the latest dude bro discovery from the New York Review of Books Classics and immediately write a 2,000-word think piece for Harper's about how it's the greatest thing ever written. Hence, the rise of Stoner. Uh... That isn't true. <laughs> there's, there's nothing wrong with having a favorite that is not the best example of what it is. There just isn't. And there's nothing wrong with that. You, what you feel about a book is different from its technical merits. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> uh, I wanted to stress that because, of course, there are really good Star Trek novels. But my favorite is not one of them. My favorite is The Price of the Phoenix by Sandra Marshak and Marilyn Calbridge, which I love and read innumerable times, but I'm perfectly willing to admit, not only is it not everybody's cup of tea, but it's not the best Star Trek novel by a long shot. <laughs> so, so. And then when it comes to giant killer shark novels, uh, I know that I should say Jaws, because I think Jaws has literary merit, which, let's just safely say, none of the rest of them do. <laughs> but when it comes to giant killer shark novels, really, the thing that's going to make it a favorite is going to be how big the shark is. And so my my uh, doff of the hat here goes to Meg by Steve Alton, where the shark is gigantic because it's a megalodon. <laughs> uh, and when it comes to the Habsburgs, I don't have any favorites. Okay? 
I only have despised, hated candidates at this point, and that's just going to get worse. <laughs> but those are favorites. Then we'll move on to uh, what you're currently reading or what you have just finished. And when it comes to Westerns, uh, I just finished this. This man must die. <laughs> this is this is by William Johnstone. Is William Johnstone the Western people out there? Is William Johnstone still alive? Who is the other Johnstone mentioned here? Is the other Johnstone mentioned a son or a nephew or a grandson who is writing this series? This is this is a Buck Trammell novel. He was a, a Pinkerton agent and now he's a sheriff. And for some reason that I have yet to understand, I've read this book, but I do not understand why he's firing a, a ray gun on the cover of this book. Uh, it's not explained anywhere in the novel. <laughs> the, the novel is... Uh, uh, it's it's about it it kind of sets in the other Buck Trammell books. There's a there's a, a guy, a kind of a kingpin of crime named Lucian Clay, who is finally in jail after all the wrong that he has done in the world. He's finally in jail, and in this book, his lawyer decides that since he couldn't win at court, he's going to win just with force by breaking Lucian Clay out of jail. And uh, that causes a gigantic ruckus in town. And luckily, uh, Buck Trammell is right there <laughs> to to handle things with his ray gun. Uh, I didn't read this as part of June on the Range. I read this because it's a new release. Uh, but it would work. I'm trying not to jump the gun for June on the Range or Book Trek. I'm trying not to start until the first of the month. But this would this would definitely count. I'm I'm excusing myself by saying that I would have read this anyway, even if June on the Range for some odd reason did not exist. I would still have read this. Uh, so that's my Western, is a William Johnstone, who really doesn't do anything for me, I have to say. I, I've i been told by fans of Westerns that I shouldn't read his later stuff, the stuff that's coming out now. I should read his much earlier stuff, 300 books ago. Uh, but the stuff that I'm reading, I haven't got around to doing much of that, but the stuff that I'm reading now from him is always new releases. He always has a book a year at least. And I read those, but and I thanks to June on the Range, I have become more and more aware of how good cheesy dime store westerns can be. They can be a lot better than this. This is kind of kind of limp. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe maybe I should go back and read earlier stuff of his. His fans have told me that. And then for Star Trek, in terms of what I just read, what I've just recently read, it's, as far as I know, the only Star Trek novel published so far in 2023. It's a Strange New Worlds novel, the very first one. Uh, John Jackson Miller's The High Country, which has a lot in common with June on the Range. It's it's the Enterprise going to a, a, a strange new world and being disabled by a weird energy field and that leaves four characters stranded on a planet. Captain Pike, number one, Mr. Spock, and Uhura. They are all on a planet and they are all separated from each other. So it's basically four adventures on a world that is operating under the burden of anti-technology. Higher tech doesn't work. Not because of some electronic or electrical disturbance of some kind. So someone very much does not want it to work. And our, our crew members find that out right away. And it's... Uh, this author, I swear, <laughs> this is a, an exciting premise. The, the, the segments here are, are largely dull, except for number one. Uh, it, it has a bigger plot. There is, of course, a bigger plot involved, and that is handled very well. This is all mechanically done. It's Mechanically, it's very well done. I can definitely see the, the whiteboard or the story graph online that it was plotted on to make sure that nothing's left out. Nothing's forgotten, but nothing soars either. And I, I kind of want that, and it's, it's amazing that I do, considering how many years it's been, years, of reading Star Trek, contemporary Star Trek novels since I saw that in any way. Why I, is the, my main question. Why is it that, that Star Trek writers feel this way? Is it just that they have a heavy hand placed on them by corporate? And so they don't feel that they can make it soar? I... I don't know. I guess the way to know for sure at least one index of what I'm talking about would be if I chase down the writings of these people elsewhere, the writings that they do that aren't Star Trek, where there wouldn't theoretically be anything to stop their prose from soaring. 
so John Jackson Miller or Una McCormick or any of these other people, if I go and find their, their science fiction, their non-Star Trek science fiction, will it be just as flat, just as programmatic and dutiful? I don't really know. Uh, but yeah, it wasn't a bad reading experience. I, sh I should stress that. It wasn't a bad reading experience. It was just... Uh, no, as far as an explicitly bad reading experience goes, we'll save that for this next one which is the just read in the giant killer shark scene. This is Greg Beck, and this is a book called Leviathan, in which our main character, Kate Granger, is enlisted by a cryptic Russian billionaire, didn't know there were any of those left, <laughs> uh, to, ex to explore a weird hidden world under Antarctica. And if you've read Steve Alton's novel, The Trench, you will know the story here, which is that it turns out there's a gigantic prehistoric biome thriving in this hidden land, this hidden ocean under the under Antarctica, including megalodons. Monsters are real. There are also some monsters in that trench. That was the the way that Steve Alton upped the ante in his Meg series, where he gives us a megalodon in the first book and then realizes the only way to outdo this is to give you many megalodons. Uh, even so, I mean, there's nothing new under the sun. It's true that no one had brought a megalodon to the modern-day world before Steve Alton did that in his novel. But still, giant killer shark novels aren't exactly new, and so I don't begrudge this author uh, somehow getting megalodons involved in his plot. I don't, I don't begrudge him that at all. Uh, but the... I don't know. I've read one other book by this author, and it, was, it seemed to me to be a lot more spirited than this one. This one, I don't know if it was just that, that Kate and her sidekick just didn't seem on their game in this book. They, they seemed more than ever wedded to the cliche of the moment, and I, it, didn't, it didn't do anything for me, is what I'm trying to say. So, so unfortunately, uh, for current reading, for my current reading for all of these categories, uh, This Man Must Die and uh, The High Country and Leviathan, my current reading on all of them was not anything that I can sit up and clap like a trained seal. <laughs> uh, and that is also true of uh, my latest Habsburg thing. This was by far the best book of the four. This was the one we just talked about the other day, The Habsburgs by Martin Rady. This is his de rigueur, one volume history. He's really good at pacing his chapters. He's really good at making sure that you're never getting just meta history that you're getting personalities and colorful locales and all of that he's really good at all of that really good at the pacing of his book you really notice the pacing i have to assume i don't know anything about this author but i have to assume that that skill at pacing comes from endless hours entertaining students in the classroom that's certainly what it feels like and so i you know i don't have any objections to this book at all it, it was it seemed to me to be pro forma it didn't seem to me to, to really dig into the habsburgs in a, in a way that can be done, that definitely can be done. I've seen it done, uh, but it it didn't offend. It wasn't it wasn't stupid <laughs> anyway. And then we'll move to uh, what's coming up, and what's coming up for two of these four categories is June. <laughs> I won't I won't I'll hold off until June before I read the next installment in either Star Trek or westerns because June first starts off June on the Range and Summer of Trek. Uh, and for June on the Range, I'll be reading uh, an author that we've seen on this channel. I I think I hauled a little paperback of his copy, OU Tex. Uh, and this is this is William McLeod Rain, who's one of those Western authors where you find a paperback in a you know in a box in a sale or a yard sale or something like that. And if you idly Google their name, you realize they wrote hundreds of Westerns, hundreds of them. Uh, and this guy did the same. The one that I found of him was just the tip of the iceberg. So from William McLeod Rain, I will be reading Bucky O'Connor. Uh, just know the traditional Western, I'm sure you can tell just by looking at it. <laughs> uh, and then for Star Trek, I will be doing a reread to start off Book Trek, the summer of Trek, Book Trek 2023. I'm going to start off Book Trek by giving a serious sit-down consideration to the Star Trek stories written by James Blish. This is Star Trek. This is the, the first one that he did. Uh, he, the cover artist was going only by studio art that they had been supplied. James Blish was doing, going only by studio scripts 
that he had been supplied, as you can tell, obviously, since uh, the Enterprise is blasting around that planet with a gigantic flame coming out of the shuttle bay. <laughs> you, you see, this is just, that right there is just a matte painting that was done for the show. The cover artist is just using it. That's all. Uh, and you sometimes will see this. I believe that uh, this is collectible. Not the first one, not the one that is that looks like this. But shortly after this, I think in the next two or three years, this was reissued with a big number one. Still the same cover artwork, but with a big number one on it. Because all the other Star Trek novels by James Blish, all the other Star Trek books by James Blish are numbered. And I think that numbered one is even more collectible than this, in really good condition. But uh, I have never liked these James Blish adaptations because obviously they don't speak to the show. Obviously they don't. Uh, they can't, especially this first one. But I'm going to give it a try because I have I have been considering James Blish as a science fiction author. I've not liked any of his work as a science fiction author. It has seemed to me to be very gimmicky and very shallow. But a lot of people, a lot of you science fiction people have sung his praises and told me you really ought to give him another try, and that's enough for me. So I have a, I have a side mission here for a book track. I'm going to start with all of James Blish, except Spock Must Die. I'm not going to read Spock Must Die again in my life. <laughs> but I'll reread these stories and see what Blish does. I'll be looking especially to see what he does with what he has. Because I know what can be done. I know at least that more can be done than what I, I, I remember him doing. We will see. Uh, we will see. I will start with this one. <laughs> and then uh, as far as upcoming reads in the Giant Killer Shark series, well, again, Steve Alton came up with the idea, the cheese fastic, uh, fantastic idea of bringing a megalodon to the present age. Megalodons were prehistoric sharks. They are absolutely extinct, no matter what any fake documentary online or on, on TV will tell you. They are absolutely extinct. Uh, but once upon a time, they ruled the oceans, and they were gigantic. They were five or six times as big as a giant great white shark. And they feasted accordingly. They ate things that are no longer around. They, they, their food source is also gone. Uh, and writers haven't been able to resist the, the, the idea of bringing them back. And Max Walder uh, doesn't resist that idea. There is a megalodon going straight for a great white shark. But I have a feeling in the course of this novel that that megalodon is going to start eating people. <laughs> I just call it a wild guess. I'm guessing that it will. But when you're committed to a ridiculous subgenre, as I am, to giant killer shark novels, you read them all. <laughs> there aren't many, so you read them all, and I will read this. I don't expect to be wowed. Uh, and then there's the Habsburgs. Uh, this one is by Andrew Wheatcroft. I have read this already, but uh, I read the Martin Radio already as well. I think I have, but this one I remember. This is the Habsburgs Embodying Empire. There they are. Uh, I, I, I seem to remember Wheatcroft being really good. Uh, this is from probably 40 years ago, something like that, but... It's next on my list. <laughs> it's it's coming up. It's a reread, but it's next on my list. Uh, and that is it. That is the Omnivore book tag uh, for Tag Tuesday. I'm hoping that all the rest of you will do this if you haven't done it already. Mainly for nosy reasons. I, I of course, want to know, as a sort of a PS to all of these, these prompts, uh, how much of an Omnivore you are when it comes to reading. Are you one at all? Are you, do you, are you strictly constricted in what you will read one of these people who says oh, i just read murder mysteries or even i just read cozy murder mysteries or i only read non-fiction but it's only faith books i want to read exegesis of the bible i want to read faith memoirs i want to read inspirational books but i don't really want to read secular books at all and i have had people in the course of my life admit that to me bashfully because they assume i'm going to come down on them like a ton of bricks that is not true there's no wrong way to read. If you're, if you're, that's floating your boat. If you're enjoying yourself that way, then go too. I will have a million questions about it, but uh, one of those questions will absolutely not be, "What are, the heck are you doing?" I absolutely will not be asking you that. You're reading. You're following your own passion in reading. That's fine by me. But I'm curious to know about all of you. Are you fairly constricted readers? Are you wide open? Will you read anything if it comes to you from, let's say, a good source, or uh, at the right moment? I'd love to hear about it. Absolutely love to hear about it. Like, for instance, if you read only fiction, so contemporary fiction, maybe a little science fiction if it's got a contemporary feeling to it, 
maybe a little historical fiction, and you don't ever read anything else. You just read fiction. If you just, if you're that kind of a reader, fine, that's fine, that's great. But I'm wondering, if you're that kind of a reader, what would it take to get you to read a new history of Jack the Ripper? What would be the most likely thing to do that? Would it be that you encountered it in a novel and wanted to know more? Or might it be BookTube itself? Might it be that you encounter a BookTuber you really like and think, you know, I don't think, I've never considered myself a reader of X, Y, or Z genre, but this BookTuber has me convinced that I would like it. I'm going to try it. If that's ever happened to you, I would love to hear. I would love to hear all these details. But feel free, feel free to do this tag. This is, this is also a, a kind of a sonogram of where your genre and subgenre reading is, especially on the doorstep of a summer that is genre heavy. <laughs> so, so I'll wrap this up for now, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, book two.